Okay, question. Um, a couple of questions here before we move on to the next. I'll just deal with that. Um, would you commence in injections prior or post symptoms? And this is I sit with came back from when we're talking about pentazan. I would personally just wait until you have some symptoms, um, unless you maybe consider using HA once every three months, something like that. There, that would that would be good. Um, would you use or recommend hydrogels? Okay, so hydrogels. We're talking about a product called Arthromid. It's on the market. Um, I have used a lot of it in racing. Um, I suppose I've seen quite good results with it at times, and I've seen other results that have been a bit middling. So I've stuck more with the IRAPs. I find them more useful um, because a IRAP we get more collect more treatments out of each collection. So I've got more in the freezer. So if your horse down the track has a flare up of a joint or something that I need to treat. I've got it in the freezer ready to go. So quite like that there. So personally, I've used the hydro a lot in, um, I was involved in the licensing study and we injected quite a lot of horses with it to see the effect on it. And look, it, it seemed to work, it seemed to work quite well. I think it is a good useful treatment for the right horse. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, no foot, no horse. Um, we're talking about older horses here. Right, so you're, you're talking your 10, 12, 13. They're, they've got the feet, right? So anything that's happened previously, um, someone asked before, you know, earlier, would you start injecting Pendazan on you know, a young horse or HA? I'd much rather you work on the feet, the barrier, to be honest. So if you've got a really good horse and it's got dodgy feet as a four year old, five year old, that's the time to be fixing them. That's the time to be not putting your head in the sand and saying, oh, well, that's just his feet. That's the time to change them. So preventing those horses, those collapsed heels, those the heels that want to run forward, that's the time to spend your money fixing them. Because if you fix them then as a four or five-year-old, you've got so much better chance. When you present a 10, 12, 13-year-old horse that's got collapsed heels running forward, it's almost, no, it's too late. We can do stuff, but it's so much harder and it's so much easier to get done earlier. So come in all different shapes and sizes. Every one of these horses, um, was competing to a different level and so it's something you have to be aware of there'll be stuff going on in the feet this horse has got a chip in its coffin joint never had a day's lameness in its life it's there it's probably been there since it was a fall it's not causing a problem so um don't get sucked in just you have to just assess um you have to get your team okay this is your team so whether it's your vet your, your, it has to be your vet your farrier all on the same team um, so you've got horses that have got chronic issues you're going to have to deal with. So this is a 15 year old horse. It's got serious side bone. Like it's, it's impressive side bone. Horses signed as a bell. Okay. So now do you, this is where I ask whether you accept for perfection. Do you try and change things with these feet or do you just leave them and accept that's what you've got? I think sometimes you have to balance that. You sometimes have to just accept the imperfections in your older horse's feet and say, not causing a problem now maybe we can tinker with it and gradually change it so a horse has got a collapsed heel run heel in the off season when it's quieter we'll pull its heels back we'll really pull it back when it can be a little bit foot sore and you might have to give it a couple of days of butte and be easy on it that's the time to do stuff but when you've got a really older horse don't rush to change things so discuss with your farrier and your vet don't get hung up on perfection um, if the horse is sound okay the other thing I have to, you have to ask is no uh, this is a horse I became involved with um, that with all the best intentions in the world and um, had, had multiple a uh, couple of farriers on it and things were changed to try and deal with the issues identified so this side bone here okay so there's changes made in the shoe and different all of there it actually made the horse sore <laughs> the horse was made lame. So we went back to the original shoeing cycle, which was a very simple side clip shoe thing, and the horse was signed as bell. So every time we change something on this here, the foot, it affects higher up the leg as well. So you know you've got a collapsed heel and you want to get that nice palmer angle. Um don't wedge it. Be careful of wedging. You wedge those there, you can cause proximal suspensory pains and um, front legs and back legs. So um Okay, so what are we looking for in your foot x-rays? Um, uh, 
what are we looking for? So we're looking at two things, the palmar plantar angles. So this um, is the angle the bottom of the pedal bone makes with the sole. The sole. Um, this horse is eight degrees, um, really nice. We're looking for somewhere three to five. You know, you classify this horse as maybe a bit upright. So in these x-rays, and this is where it's really, really important to look at the horse, the holistic approach. Um, if I were to present these x-rays to people, they'd say, well, this horse is too upright. You know, eight, nine degrees is too high, but he's a short pastured horse and he's upright in his conformation. So this works for him. That's his confirmation. So someone trying to change his heels to get him back to that three to five degree dropping him will make him in, in a terrible position and make him sore. So this way you, you look at the whole thing. Sometimes an x-ray is, is only part of the, the answer. You're also looking at soul depth and um, different times of the year. Um, we're looking at how deep the soul is. Um, Next thing is the balance through the coffin joint. Now, this is a, can be a little bit hard to explain. So when we say that there, when a horse lands, the center of rotation is through this point here, just in the pasture where the coffin joint rotates around. Okay. In an ideal world, we want to have 40% of the foot behind this line and 60% in front. Okay. Now, when you can imagine if you've got a horse with the heels running forward, the closer that heel bulb gets to that line, the more pressure we're putting on a smaller part. Now, we all know if people tend last week, we've got some major structures in this area, your navicular bone, your deep digital flexor tendon, the navicular bursa, the impar ligaments, the collateral ligaments, everything's in this area that we don't want to put excess pressure on. So trying to get as good a balance there is perfect. This horse is, is almost perfect, to be honest. Um, this horse is actually almost perfect. Um, Um, so that's, um, yeah, so we want to do that there. And then we want to look at the medial lateral button. So this is a horse a little bit different. You can see the variation. Uh, this horse's heels want to run forward. They're ending there. And you've got this long toe. So this horse needs a lot of help to try and help support it. And the most important thing in this horse I did was actually just bring the shoe back. And um, when we do that, I warn you, don't blame your farrier for pull shoes. Um, you really have to be brave and don't mark a farrier based on whether the shoes stay on for six weeks or not, or five weeks. Um, if they pull an occasional shoe because the back foot catches it, it's because we have horses and paddocks. Um, compared to European warm rods where they're standing in boxes, they don't have that same forces that are going on. And so you have to put a lot of length on the shoes. And I think it's important. So some horses need to breathe, live in over each boots. Okay, so let's see if a few questions. Okay, all right, I'll answer those in a minute. Okay, so do you show, show a horse as two pairs or four individual? Um, that's a good question. Okay, now this horse here, these images here, you can see. Hold on, I'll just move this. Um, you can see. These are the front feet of one horse. Same horse, you can see quite obviously they're different, right? This is more upright. This is long, wants to be longer toe and run forward. Okay, so they're very different feet. You have to shoe each foot. You don't shoe a pair. So what I'm going to do to this foot is going to be different to what I'm doing to this foot. So. Unless you're doing high speed work, so maybe a vinters, I might qualify that. I wouldn't be rushing to have too much weight on one foot versus the other. But in a dress size horse or a shoe jumper, I have no problem whatsoever showing four different shoes on the horse because you shoe each foot to have the positive effect. So, yeah, we just look at these in comparison. You can see they're very, they're very different, okay? Very, very different feet. Um, and you have to shoe them differently. So, um, so you use different shoes for different times of the year as well. Um, it's another thing, um, pads, uh, leather pads are great in the summer, really love them. 
clients that normally have, I recommend them quite freely. If you've got thin soles, they need to come off in winter because you get a lot of moisture underneath. Um, okay. So I'm going to answer a few questions. Um, just come in. Um, okay. Farrier has put raised wedges at the heel following a mild laminitis. To me, the angle looks better, but I believe you said you don't approve of wedges. It's not I don't approve of wedges. I just am very aware that when you wedge a horse up, um, you put more strain. The fetlock joint will drop more as the horse lands. It will put more strain on the suspensory ligament and the attachment. So if you're working a horse in wedges, I think they're more prone to getting proximal suspensory pain. So that's where you've got to balance. So if you've got a horse with mild laminitis, it may not be in full work and you have to be backing off the work to fix its laminitis and then fix its feet. Wedges are only part of uh, I feel a short-term fix. So if you've got a collapsed heel, so if you've got the, the heels wanting to run forward, if you put a wedge and bash them up like that, you'll actually collapse them more over time. So those wedges stay on long-term, they will collapse those heels more. You've got to work there. The wedge is to take the strain off the deep digital flexor and stop the pull on the pedal bone just to reduce the laminitis uh, changes. So you've got, to, you've got to affect that so they don't stay on long-term, they've got to get off at some point. Okay, a couple more questions. Right. Um, concussion plates. Someone asked about concussion plates. There's actually no data really to show that they're beneficial. I think they make us feel better. Um, I think reduce, certain types of shoes can reduce concussion, but I'm, I'm not completely convinced concussion plates make a massive difference. So. Um, one other question now. So, would you take shoes off an 18 year old and change the boots because he's starting to get impossible to shoe? Not necessarily. I'd want to know why he's impossible to shoe. Is the reason he's impossible to shoe because he's painful and he's sore? Um, has he got low grade laminitis? So, standing on the other foot for a long time is causing pain. That would be my thought is why why is this horse suddenly painful and a lot of times you'll find that there's a reason for their painful and that's why they don't want to be shot okay so one more question at this time okay so look at this this horse, this is a, I'm going to go through this case. This is a, a dressage horse um, that's sort of semi-retired, but in work. And the rider reported um, not quite happy going forward. And they felt it wasn't quite going as well as it once was. So what did, um, had a look at this case. There's two feet, you've got two odd feet. Okay, we've got a left front foot and a right front foot. Um, I'll just, um, it will be obvious to a lot of you that the horse was lame in the right front foot. So we blocked the right front foot. Um, there was a, it was pretty much signed to be honest. There wasn't much change the other side, but you see here, we go back our palmer angle. Um, palmer's for the foreleg, planters for the hind leg. Palmer angle's two degrees with the sole, and this here it's zero degrees, okay? So it's a bit flat footed on the right front. This horse has been like this for a long time. I've known the horse off and on for probably four or five years and she's always had terrible feet um, and that's part of it. So this is a horse where I say I wouldn't want to wedge. Just because this is zero degrees, don't crush these heels even more because you can see that heel bulb is running down in. You can guarantee those horn tubules are almost running horizontally. I put a pressure and wedge up there. I'll just collapse them even more um, over long term. So I'll get a short term fix to make an x-ray look good, but it won't have a positive effect on the horse. So we then look at the balance. Um, you can see this, this foot's pretty good, could be a little bit better, and this foot's well out of whack. You know, we're getting all this pressure on the back end of the foot. Um, this horse has had navicular syndrome in the past, um, and it also has metabolic issues. So I can't even just put cortisone in to a navicular bursa to help it or something like that. So I have to change and manage it. So what did I do? Um, basically, the changes we made on this this horse was we extended the shoe out the back to we give more length to um, more 
So we give more length. We pull this line back further. The horse lives in bell boots in the paddock anyway, because she's known to pull shoes. And with the front of the shoe, we actually grind out the toe quite a lot more so that we get a better breakover for the horse. So by doing that there, we're, the shoe is the interaction with the grind. Um, so you have to shorten this here and try and get this horse rolling over quicker. We did take some toe off as well. Um, but the main thing we're doing is we're working from the grind up. So I get a bit cross when we just see toes rasped off just to remove the front of the foot to make it look prettier. We need to trim them from the grind from the bottom up. And by that means change the interaction, the force that the horse makes with the grind going forward. So let me see just a few questions. Okay. Um, Um, do you recommend fillers or packers under the pads? And if so, would, what would be the benefit of using them? Um, look, at, depending on the case, I will use them. Um, dental impression material to give some support around the sides of the frog um, to give a more sort of uniform pressure across the back of the foot. I will use them. Um, again, you're altering the forces, what's going up and down. Um, we'll use the Equipack. Um, you inject it in the gel. The only problem I find with that there is the horses can be quite slippy on it. So if they're working on grass or shoe jumping on grass, you have to be up to date with your studs. And they even would maybe need three stud holes, uh, one at the toe as well, because they will slip. And you have to, have, and I, I, I think they're really useful. The right horse dress size horse is not a big problem, but if you're riding at lower levels, not as prevalent now, but if you're competing on grass, um, I wouldn't be putting Equipack in the feet. Okay. Right, so weight management. And um, we're talking about the older horse again. Yeah. Body weight, body weight, body weight. It can also be a sign of metabolic issues and you need to match your into feed intake to work up. So it is something I am very aware of. I talk to people a lot about keeping the weight off the top of the horse reduces the forces on the legs. The biggest cause of retirement of a horse is limbs issues. Um, so if we can reduce the force on the legs, you're gonna have a beneficial effect. So metabolic issues, um, we've actually taken a bit longer to get here than what I thought. So I will probably run through this a little bit quicker um, and I will cover it a bit more detail. So um, metabolic issues, the three main ones I'm gonna to touch on um, for me are Cushing's disease, insulin resistance and inflammatory bile disease. Um, this might be something you're not aware of as much, but it's something I'm becoming more prevalent in the area. Not every Cushing's horse looks like this, the shaggy pony with the curly hope. That's not it. We're seeing it more and more. It's more prevalent. Partly that's we're testing more. It's so much easier to test. We've got the blood test, the ACTH. It's simple as pulling a blood tube. That is really simple product. Um, really, um, really simple test to do. So we do it all the time. It's part of a routine assessment from these older horses before I put quarters on in, if I'm concerned at all, that they might be cushionoid um, and they're high risk of having laminitis after cortisone injections. So they're not all, some of them might be drinking a little bit excessively, but most of our horses live in paddocks. So how do we know if we're not, unless we're measuring water and um, they're a little bit poor doing, they can occasional fat, pad, fat pads and the poor immunity. Sometimes then we can have poor coat as well. Um, okay, so testing, these are all the horses we've tested in the last five weeks, okay? 458, 26, 46, 69, 209, 106. This number is not necessarily related to clinical disease. This horse at 458 was tested because he was 23 years of age and he was just not as willing and wanting to work as much. Okay, that was generally the complaint that he just was, and the con concern was where we were having a discussion about retirement. Um, and we pulled this here and we got 458. It's a really high number, um, and that horse has gone into treatment. Okay, so it can be beneficial. Um, so, sorry. 
Um, there's a seasonal variation in the results. It's not about comparing your number necessarily unless you're, comp you're, you're measuring the, at the same time. It's where you sit within regards to the reference range. So in the autumn, the reference range is higher. It's up to 69, 70, depending on the lab. And um, we're in the summer, it's probably 27. Um, it's really simple to do, but be aware it's only the 80, 83% specific. Okay, so there can be horses that can have normal ACTH levels and um, still be Cushionoid. How do you treat them? Um, okay, this is where I probably, I've probably had a few arguments with people. Pergolid is the drug of choice. So Pergolid, Meslid, it's two forms. There's the liquid form or there's the tablet form. Both great products, no preference either way, just depending on the dose rate. The horse, I like the liquid sometimes more to stabilize a horse because I can vary the amount. Um, there is no known withholding period. I know some people have done some testing and they've tested one horse. When you're testing N equals one, you do not get reliable results. We really need multiple tests. It is a banned substance under FEI rules and EA adopts the same rules. So while I can see a real use for it in those older competition horses at national level, currently this is what we, the playing field we deal with. So horses on it, I don't really want them on and off it. I don't think it's good for them. You know, as you can imagine, you're trying to stabilize a chronic disease and you're stopping and starting. Um, so you, you just be careful of that. Um, I'd have a discussion with you, depending on what we felt needed treatment and whether we could just monitor the horse. Um, there are some herbs, chest and berries been shown. Some horses have responded well for that with Cushing. So I'm open to all suggestions, um, but you need to be careful. It is a daily medication for the rest of life. Um, you tailor the dose and you have to test. There's some side effects initially when they go on it, such as um, anorexia and not eating. That happens, you need to stop and ring your bed um, and discuss it further what you're gonna do. Okay, insulin resistance. This is something that's become more prevalent and we're seeing more of in the general area. Um, as we look more for it, we are seeing it more. So they've got fat deposits, they're good doers. They, they might even be young horses. So they might even be five or six. Um, you're getting increased insulin levels and down regulation of the insulin receptors and you're getting high glucose levels. Um, you need to manage those horses quite aggressively. It's, you know, it's, it, the management is high intensity. So low sugars, stable protein, Unfortunately, you can, you can do it in horses, but the uh, blood test and exercise is really important. There's some drugs we can use in these. Um, someone did ask a question here, which I'm just going to read out. Um, uh, what is it? Sorry. Given the known association of seed oils in humans and insulin resistance, are you aware of any evidence of seed oils such as canola oil and metabolic disease in horses? No, I am not. Um, that's a great question, and I think that's really something that needs research. Um, one of the weaknesses of the equine industry as a whole is how we fund research, and I think that's something that really needs to be looked into, and I would be, I think it's a great area to look into because we do feed a lot of oils, and the management is different. So, question, is insulin resistance more common in some breeds than others? Uh, warm bloods are definitely overrepresented and it's something to be aware of. Um, I know with small animals, majority of Cushing's are actually brain tumors. It's the same, yes, it's a pituitary adenoma. That's what's causing it. Um, How do you recommend keeping energy levels up in a high performance uh, insulin resistant horse without increasing weight? Um, that's oil. Using oil is probably the most beneficial way to do that there. Um, and just sort of slowing down that uptake, uh, low glycemic intake style of food. Um, that's the only way and it's a trial and error. I would recommend someone a lot more qualified than me to deal with that there, uh, guys at KER. Kentucky Run Research are world leaders in research on uh, feeding, so I would recommend contacting them and discussing that a bit more. Okay. 
So, um, what early clinical signs would prompt you to recommend a Cushing's test for should for should I get my twenty three year old test in case? Look, I, I think it's something to keep an eye on. Um, depending on what the horse is doing, if it's standing in the paddock and he's retired and he's quite healthy and happy, then I think you can probably keep an eye on him. But if there's certain things like he's feeling to gain weight, then I would definitely consider testing them. Yes. What drugs are used for insulin resistance? Well, look, a lot of them are about sort of thyroid hormones and getting everything fired up there. And um, they have to be compounded. They're not off the shelf. And we have to order them in for you. So it's probably on a case by the couple of different ones we would use. Um, it depends on the, the case. Okay. So inflammatory bowel disease. It's a lot more common than what it once was. And um, we've seen it in a few horses. Um, and they present in some strange and wonderful ways. Um, you often it starts in the early teens. Um, a couple of signs, the few signs we see are chronic skin inflammation, so horses with really bad skin. Um, atopy, or we call it in the veterinary world, is linked to the bile. So small animal people have had dogs that have got itchy skin and they've been put on a, dr a food trial. It's, it's very linked. Horses are, are pretty similar as well. Um, they're often a little bit wet around the bum or tail bag. They're not flat. They're usually perfectly fine. And they've got normal dropping balls, but water around them. It is something, I don't know why we're seeing more of it, whether we're managing these horses and expecting these horses to do more at an older age than we once were 10, 15 years ago. I've definitely seen a lot of it. Um, management is a key. It's one of those cases where I can give you drugs to help them, but unless you've got your management right, you can't fix these. Um, I've been involved in a couple of high, uh, high maintenance horses to get this here. And it really is, it's a case of writing everything down and really um, controlling everything. So every stability is the key and working out what you can do. So a um, couple of key points is the hay supply. If you're going to change over hay supply, you need to be ahead of the game. So you need to be buying hay in a reasonable amount and storing it and then mixing it in with your last years and gradually introducing to change it over three, four or five weeks. Um, they do better off if they manage off grass, to be honest. The springtime grass can really set a lot of them off. Um, a good hard feed, uh, I've used uh, one brand in particular um, really well with a lot of these and it, it, does, um, it does seem to work. I have no affiliations with the company at all, but I have used the Harry's Choice brand on some of these horses and they have responded really well and the management's been good. Um, and supplements can be a problem. So the binders that are used in supplements or the bulking agents can sometimes set some of these horses off. So inflammatory bowel disease, inflammation of the hind gut, and so these that's why they're not absorbing water. It's, it's the last part of the gut before it comes out as poo. Um, I've known some product, even Equisure, to set one horse off. You know, one of one of my most challenging cases. Um, he was set off by Equisure. Now, Equisure technically, as you pick it up and read the label, should have been ideal for him, but actually set him off uh, and didn't help him at all. So just something to be aware of. Okay, right. I'll answer a couple of quick questions. I think we're all, okay. Right. Okay, so exercise for the older horse. Um, we're approaching one hour, so I will try and work my through so I don't bore you too, too much and hope you've enjoyed it. Um, exercise for the older horse. How do we manage the exercise? Um, it's really important how we manage the exercise. Um, I've had a lot of questions by email, and of course, with the next webinar coming up, you can drop me an email, no problem at all. I'm happy to put it in because it helps me know what you guys want to learn about. And so some people have sent in, one lady, I mean, nameless, pretty much give me an essay, um, well done. Um, and pretty much covered this entire talk. And I think that's really what it is. So people have asked questions. So how often do you exercise your older horse? So with these older horses, I'm talking... I'm probably going to split here before I've been sort of talking, but generally the older horse. So your high level horse, so your Olympic horse, your Grand Prix horse, you know, your Adelaide five-star horse or your World Cup show jumper. I'm not going to interfere too much with your management, and your training. You know, you want to keep that regular and you want to be switched on if you're competing at that level. I'm talking now here about the older school master. 
that you're wanting to compete and, and keep going forever because they're amazing. And a lot of them are worth their weight in gold and priceless and irreplaceable. So regular is better than irregular. Same with us. It's much better if I say I want to do two hours of running a week. It's a whole lot better for me to do it over, do 40 minutes or do, you know, do it four times a week, 30 minutes than trying to do two hours on a Saturday because I won't be able to walk Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I'll be Friday, I'll be walking again, and then I'm back running again. If you do it regularly, it's better. Same with the horses. It doesn't need to be six days, doesn't need to be five days. It depends on your horse. Everyone, a couple of people have asked me how many days a week. There's no set rules. You've got to play around. You've got to investigate. You've got to research, you know, and you've got to trial with your horse what works for your horse depend and what works with your life. So there's no point in me saying you should work your horse for six days a week for 20 minutes when you have to drive an hour and a half to get to your horse, you know, round trip, and it's not feasible. So in which case then you're probably four times a week or five times a week at 30 minutes. With the training of these older horses, you've got to break down your aims. You've got to, you cannot have a horse at a high level all the time. It's the same as an athlete. They're an athlete and you cannot keep them at that level. You've got to peak and trough them. That's natural. So you've got to go like that. It's got to be... What you want for the older horse is not is to make sure the troughs aren't too deep and the peaks aren't too high. Okay, so you're heading in direction. Sit down with your coach, work out what your aim is, where you're going, um, and plan your lessons with your schedule. So when that, what that means, um, example. Okay, um, I've been involved in a few cases where we've had lameness issues in a horse leading into a major competition, okay? And for everyone, I say to everyone, everyone's got their own Olympics and for whatever your major competition. These horses were aimed for this, the owner's major competition and we, two to three weeks out, we had an issue. Now, if they'd have kept going at the normal training rate, they'd have had a broken horse and there was no way we were going to get to the grand final, you know, the Olympics. Um, so what we did was um, we altered training and dropped them down. Now, that's really hard for you as a rider. I understand that. For all of us, we get nervous. We want to train more. We want to dot our eyes, cross our T's. You might actually be better with these older horses to back off a bit. So in racing, we say it's well known by some racehorse trainers. You know, they, they do their last bit of hard work seven days out from a race. And it's the same with your dressage horses. Maybe seven days may be extreme, but I wouldn't recommend for the older horse, as much as it's great for you as a rider to be fine-tuned on a Friday for a Saturday competition, it's maybe not the best for your horse, especially these older horses. Maybe you should be having your lesson on the Tuesday, okay? And then a little fine-tune on a Thursday, an easy day, even an off day on Friday for the horse. And I've seen multiple times where we've done this and people have got their, you know, I, I still remember one lady who I think was about to have a heart attack over how little training she'd done going into a dressage test and she got the best ever result. Okay. And that was because the horse was feeling great. The horse was feeling fabulous and he performed and it was, you know, let's be honest, when we're sitting on schoolmasters, they can do it themselves. You know, a lot of these good dressage schoolmasters, I, I swear they can read the test. They know the test. The only problem is the FEI keeps changing them all around and they get a bit, oh, I can't remember this test. Um, but it's the same with the show jumpers. You know, we get them to the bottom of the jump. They jump the jump. Okay. Same with the venters. You know, you, you've got to be careful. Um, so how much is too much? You've got you to play around, work out what works for your horse. Some horses will work really well in 20, 30 minutes. Some work 40 minutes. Variation for these older horses, they're smart, they've been there, they've done it. Keep them mentally sharp. You know, it, it's, I'm not, you know, there's plenty of people talking about this. Um, and the last talk we did on tendon injury and rehab, we talked about some variations in alternative training methods. And I said, well, you know, I generally like to get you guys on the horse. These older horses, this is where these, these tools, and they are tools, can be really helpful. So your treadmills, your high-speed treadmills, they don't need to be going at high speed, but maybe a horse that's got a little bit of front-end fetlock joints or stuff like that, walking up and down hills is ideal. Now, some of you have got hills, great. Some of you don't. Some of you, you, you live in flat land, you know? If you live out in Gippsland, it's flat as a pancake. Um, 
So using a treadmill, getting them on a three, four degree angle, walking one, two, one or two days a week might be really beneficial, especially coming back from a break. Walkers, just as a general exercise, if you are stabling your horses all the time, it can be really beneficial. So um, I do like them for that there. Um, so the water walkers, again, low impact. We're decreasing the concussion on the horses, doing some aerobic exercise to try and keep the body weight under check. And it's great for the chain dog. Also hacking up, we can't hack on roads that we used to. I know I growing up used to trot up and down the roads. And um, I think the take home really is get out of the arena if you can for some of these older horses. I think it'd be very beneficial. Run, run, circle's not ideal. Getting out, straight lines. You know, if you have got a hacking track in the morning to potentially, you know, there's, there are trails. They're wide enough. You can do your lateral work. You can do your leg yield. You can do your, you know, your half pass. A few strides of it, shoulder in, travers. Why can't you do it when you're walking straight line? Like that's absolutely perfect, um, and that can be you still be training, but you're getting out of the arena. So I'm just trying to keep up with the questions. Okay, so what about swimming horses in the pool? Is the question. If you've got a swimming pool, go for it. Um, word of warning, make sure that they're not scared of water. I've seen, I've been involved in one case where a warm blood decided, it's only a warm blood can do, it was trying to get into a water walker. So if anyone's seen them, they're a walking machine, circular walking machine in a pool since uh, this warm blood wasn't, it wasn't an adventure, I'll give it that. It was a show jumper. Well, it jumped into the center of the water. It jumped so unless it's your horse is used to walking through water make sure it walks through water before you put in the water at water and same with the swimming pool teach them to swim first that can be hard some of them can sink um i've seen that as well so um okay next question I'll talk a bit here surfaces and um, someone's asked a few questions on surfaces and um, they are benefit Variation of the surface is important. Depending on the condition, if you've got a joint problem, uh, softer will be better. If you've got a tendon or ligament problem, softer will be the worst thing you can do for it. So it is uh, something you have to be aware of. Um, depending on the horse and the case, surfaces is, is important. So the competition mindset for these older horses. Um, one of the things we... Um, Someone mentioned uh, beach water walking. I, I think that's as similar as water treadmill and stuff like that there. It can all be beneficial, um, making the horse work. Don't overwork it because it's never used those muscles as much and build it up. Um, I don't think there's a great lot of research yet on whether you should have them stepping over the water and lifting up or whether they're just pushing through. You're just using it as an alternative training method. Hope that helps. So the competition mindset for these older horses that I've really got to get through to people. Um, the older horse knows the job, um, but we need to train you, not the horse. And that's true for all the coaches that are on here. You will realize that you're often training the rider, the horse can do it well. Um, what I want to introduce you to, we know in race, in race horses, it's been scientifically, there's been a study done where 50, 000, each, most horses as an average have 50,000 strides at greater than 14 seconds to the furlong before each an issue becomes apparent in a joint. Okay, so it's 50,000 strides greater than 14 seconds to the furlong. I believe show jumpers and dressage horse and eventers are all the same. We've got so many miles that we can do or steps that we can do of a certain movement before we get an issue. And um, some horses might be at the one end of the curve and other horses might be at the other end. And you can all tell me there's horses that have piaffed every day of their life and never had a problem. And I can tell you there's horses that have four times and have torn a, a suspensory ligament. Um, so you need to vary that there. So what I say is the older horses try and vary your training. So you're not putting pressure on them. So you're trying to, reduce the strain you put on so if your show jumpers exact example the horse jumps you don't um is someone 
kindly Jimmy Coleman told me once um, when he was trying to teach me one when I was getting thinking about getting back into writing, but then I realized I overthought things. Um, ride to a pole. If you can get your horse to ride to a pole every time, you're, you're recreating your training without actually jumping and putting stress on your horse. Um, the dressers or riders can't really do that. You have to, but you have to aim for perfection, short and sharp. So, example, you, you in dressage, you're using the short side so much to prepare for the for what you're about to do in the rest of the arena. If your corner's not good, don't try and do the medium trot. We've only got a certain number of medium trots. Same with the half pass. If your trot's not good coming out of the corner, work on that. And and then I touched on it before. Some of these older horses, I think, do better with a day off and um, before competition. I'm convinced of it, unless they're a little bit touched in the head and you need to keep them taking over. I think they do better with a day off. Um, so really, you know, taper your work. And for people who've been athletes and training, you know, and run marathons, you taper your training. You don't run as hard right up into it. And I think sometimes in the horse industry, we're not aware of that. We're not, often I'll say not to take too much from the human area across to horse area but i think in this case we really need to consider using it and sort of backing off those horses so tapering down i see so many times horses injured as you know one last gallop before a major competition or one last exercise session or one last it's too late you know you're not going to get much change in fitness at that time and you're just sort of training yourself um so i'm just trying to keep up with all the questions Okay, so let's go to the next. Recording your work. I'm going to encourage everyone to keep a diary. I really am keep a work diary. It's really beneficial. I love it. I love it. And I know and some people think, oh, I can't believe Mike's. I love when you've got that entire history of what you've done with work and how your horse has gone. It so much helps me when I know how it's done. So you tailor that back and, and play with it and record it. Spreadsheet it, record it, diary, you know notebook i don't care keep it near a date of those things and monitor what things are how things are going so when you play with something when you change the training method um or a training schedule how has it worked on your horse you know is for example do you have a great lesson so for uh, if if you really enjoy your lessons and you want to have a good lesson you know do you treat it like a competition does your horse have a day off the day before or is it a bit too hot and then you're having to work too much just working it down to get it do that there um, you, all those things you've got to play around with and, and really play with and I think don't get over analyzed and just try and play with it and see what works don't listen to everyone listen to your horse because um, fatigue is one of the biggest causes of injuries in horses it really is um, and it, it really it, it really is So, sorry, the questions are coming in thick and fast. I'm trying to keep on top of them. Um, fatigue is one of your biggest causes of injury. Okay. So when your horse is tired, that's when they're more likely to strain something, overstretch something, same as you or I. Um, just be aware of that. So this is a statement I often feel, and it's really important for these older horses and, and for your training and stuff like that there. Is a horse better to be 100% fit and 80% happy or 80% fit and 100% happy? Most horses want to do it for us. Let's be honest, we've all had those, we've had the odd one doesn't, but majority of horses really want to do it for us. And our aim is to keep them 100% happy and as fit as we possibly can. So by that I mean, it's, it's a balancing act and I, don't, I can't answer that balance for you. Only you and your coach can probably, with, because at the end of the day, the outcome is how the horse performs whether it's in a lesson or during a ride, how it performs, that's the outcome. We're, our aim is to work it, do we get the management? But these older horses, I think you just gotta keep them taking over and they do a lot better. So a couple of other things I wanna answer now. There's, there's been a few questions um, that I haven't managed to answer and it is sort of, we've been going for sort of an hour and 15 minutes now. So I don't wanna bore you. Um, what I, People talked about giving older horses a break, okay? 
I'm not a massive fan of that. I'm a great fan of reducing the, the workload and changing it. I'm not a massive fan of giving them big, long breaks. They're older horses. Standing about in the paddock is not ideal. Um, I think that is, um, yeah, it's just something I, I don't like giving them massive time off. I'd rather you, if you said I've got reduced work, I'd rather you send the horse to a water, um, a water walker. Um, and sort of, you know, do sort of three, four days out in the paddock during the day and stuff, or out in the paddock all the time, and then come in and do water work or, or treadmill work or walking work and stuff like that there. Um, um, those are things that I find really beneficial. So another question is, how often should you ride a, a weight to keep a horse fit and happy? Um, look, that depends. Um Depends on the horse, depends on what you're aiming for. So it really is very big. But I think probably three to four times is ideal. So um, let me just see. Someone sort of agreed. Um, they had a great time when they backed off the horse and then they rode it on a different type of surface and went well. What type of, in what type of injuries benefit from pulling Cavaletti work during rehab? Well, look, anything where you're trying to get movement and, and, and variation, so you're trying to get them to lift their back, stretch their back, using the pull work is really beneficial. Um, I think that can be beneficial. If you've got someone to help you putting up trot pulls, a line of trot pulls is great. If you do not and you ride on your own and you're on your own property, put up four poles that are spread out around the ring. If you hit them once, you don't have to get off and fix them. Just coming from experience. Um, you do it once and the horse hits. Yeah, just, slats a pole and puts it out of whack and then you go back to so that's something i'm always aware um and then so i hope that has answered that a few people have asked me will the webinar be a view be available to view yes and so will the previous one they will all be available on youtube i will be loading them up i've actually really enjoy i really enjoy you guys interacting with me so i'm not rushing to put them up on youtube i'll be honest because i, I do want to encourage you guys to come if you can we're all in lockdown anyway so um i want you to come and enjoy hearing your questions and responding to them so i hope i have answered all your questions um so just a quick thing lara tweedy dot com dot au lara twitty equestrian is supporting this webinar she has offered a 25 percent off any lt branded products including cavalier toscana for lt saddle pads that have been done in conjunction with each other you just need to enter the code webinar 25 so it's webinar 25 and that's valid until friday 24th midnight um so that's available. So webinar 25, if you want a discount, if you're looking for overreach boots, um, I was involved in the design of those, so we got them big enough so that we could when we were bringing the shoes to set them off. So really well, and they wear well, and they wash well. Um, quick question someone said, how many times a week do you recommend jumping a young horse? Um, look, at the end of the day, they're not really jumping until you're above sort of 90 centimeters. Um, so if you're just training lower, I think it's fine to you know jump two or three times a week but again the horse jumps you don't jump so it's just training and getting confidence don't over jump it i wouldn't go much more than two or three times to be honest i think that's enough or little grids and burying it um i hope that helps okay so someone answered a qu ask question do you have any advice after bringing the older eight-ish eight-year-old horse back into work after an unavoidable break a rider was injured yeah look i think it's really simple um i i'm really old school i'm going to show my age here um i was taught by a lady in ireland lady perdita blackwood proper lady um very successful owner breeder rider and um, she was involved in owning every horse that won at royal dublin horse show through all the way through the show jumping through to the showing classes she was a great believer in, you know, six weeks of sort of basic walk trot work um, before doing anything serious in training. And she had adventures that, you know, competed at badminton and jumped in Nations Cups and show jumping. And she was a great believer in that. And I think we had very little injuries, to be honest, um, in her stable. And I think a lot of that was because they had a baseline fitness. And I think, so I would just start really basically, um, first of all, safety is really important. 
um, so London for a week or get someone else to help start them off for a couple for a week or 10 days and then get you on board you know really simple 10 10 10 as I, I call it you're aiming for is 10 minutes walk 10 minutes trot 10 minutes canter and um, that'll get a horse pretty aerobically fit if you can get that going sort of by the end of sort of week four week five um get them pretty aerobically fit and then step up in there and introduce everything slowly allow the horse to develop and remodel and you should be absolutely fine so okay so i'm gonna deal just a reminder webinar 25 um okay so someone asked about studs um stud position and shearing force okay now I, Depending on the horse and depending what I've got going on the foot, if I've got um, equipack in the sole where they might get slippy, I will put an outside toe uh, stud in. Um, I also don't like them too big. I think we overstud, especially in Australia where our ground's usually pretty good unless it's a bottomless um, thing. They want to be able to get in and I like them taken out after the class. So hope that answers for you. So. Okay, someone's asked uh, different webinars, um, effective foot balance on the horse's soft tissue structure. Um, Amy, that was a great question. That is actually answered in the rehab. We talked about, we talked about rehab on tendon structures, um, but if you have any questions, please drop me an email. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I really do. Uh, I've really enjoyed doing these and I've enjoyed fielding your questions. Um, just once again, larrytweedy.com.au. The next webinar is in two weeks time. So who's coming? Um, we are doing imaging and equine practice. I have convinced for people who have who know him, Dr. Ian Fulton from the Ballarat Equine Clinic is uh, one of the owners of the clinic. Uh, Ian will be coming along to discuss all things MRI and scintigraphy. So I think it's really important you guys start to understand what the variation and the difference is, when you would use them, why you would use them, and those variations. So I hope that's beneficial for you. I will be talking on um, X-ray and ultrasound, how I use it in the field. Um, I think ultrasound is one of those great tools that I love even for joints and um, assessing different structures find it very useful um, MRI and CTV are fabulous as well um, but Ian will talk more on those and I hope you join me you can you will be sent an email in about five or six days and you can sign up there so I hope you've enjoyed it um, I hope there's I've asked, I've posed some questions to you and you guys can, um, I hope you guys have enjoyed the questions and I'm really pleased you came along. So thank you very much again. And if you would like any other webinars or you have any ideas, I please drop me an email to mike at tebs.com.au or through Facebook or Instagram. Um, and I hope you've really enjoyed it. And yeah, so on Instagram, interact with me. I'm happy to answer questions if I can. And I'll see you all guys soon. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.